right, perfect. I'm Caitlin D. Clark. I'm a doctoral candidate at UC Berkeley. I also work with the Healthy Workplaces folks from Berkeley. Um, who in the room saw Dr. Banks' presentation earlier today? All right, good. So some of the slides will look a little bit familiar, but the nice thing is some of you already kind of know roughly so we'll have about two or three people per group. And we say, um, say a couple of things. First, we ask them, you know, think about what whatever your driver is, let's say connection. Think about what that means to you. We're really interested in how people are perceiving of these ideas. We know what the literature says about connection. We know what the literature says about privacy. But how do these millennial students um, make sense of it? So then based on that, they have kind of a group discussion, share their ideas, come with kind of a master list or master definition. And then the really exciting part, at least for me being interested in architecture, happens. We give them this box, right, the empty box. Imagine they had to design an office or kind of somehow modify this box to become comfortable, to become connected, to become private. What would they do to modify kind of this built setting if they could imagine it? Um, and so what we do is we have them, we, we've assigned to each group also a, de a dedicated note taker or artist, someone who can kind of help translate verbal ideas into kind of um, more pictorial um, images, because not everyone has that skill. And I'm going to share with you kind of what we've come up with in those two um, different, um, in those kind of two different prompts. And I think there's something here. So again, I want to just kind of say, where to the wise, this is preliminary data. I don't know all the answers yet. I'm knee deep in this, but I thought it would be fun just to present something um, while I could. So goals today, I'm going to share with you kind of how people are, are perceiving or defining these, um, these drivers. So for those of you interested in psychology, hopefully I, I get your attention with that one. Um, how might each driver look and feel? So what's the spatial, what's the environmental correlate of these ideas? Um, and then discuss. I'm curious to know what, what sticks out to all of you, um, kind of experts in your own fields. And then we'll think about kind of issues and next steps. So let's jump on in. Comfort um, was defined as kind of feeling good, right? It has these physical, mental, and social aspects which I thought was really interesting. I won't go through all of these. Hopefully, um, you can study this in your own time. But physical comfort was everything from kind of having the right lighting to be able to kind of move the furniture. Um, even like a good fitting chair. It's amazing how often just a comfortable chair came up in this data. Mental, right? You want to not come home feeling stressed. It's kind of like the bottom line, right? I mean, these students are articulating these things that we know and the literature approves, but it's powerful to see it come up um, in their own words. Things about like you wanting to have good relationships with coworkers. You also want to be able to talk to your boss. How do you do all this stuff? Breaks are really important for comfort. Also, individual spaces, right? This <coughs> privacy or kind of this personal space where the claim space is really important. Um, outdoor space is absolutely essential, having lots of amenities. This idea of user generated design, one group said, you know, you should give everyone $200 to kind of decorate their own office, to build, to buy their own furniture, right? Imagine that trusting a user to design their own space. Um, and then other, right? Circular buildings came up, you know, big entries, that kind of a thing. So here's what some of these ideas look like. Um, you can, again, the circular office. What's interesting is both groups that had um, this driver actually designed a circular office. I think that's pretty cool. But here you have everything from kind of childcare to gymnasia um, that you can kind of work out in. Um, you have kind of an outside area. Um, let's see what else do we have here. Um, adaptable temperature, sliding doors. Um, so this is kind of some of the ideas that came up. Here again, the circular building, you can see there's kind of a rooftop garden thing, so kind of that's how they're getting um, in touch with nature. There's also kind of glass windows on the outside. We all want to be kind of connected with nature, like this beautiful view that I have here. This group also talked about the neighborhood context, right? Like where is my office situated? I want to be in a safe neighborhood. Another group said, I don't want to be, I don't want to have any um, buildings next door so I can kind of use outdoor space. Um, and here's just again some, some other ideas. You have kind of communal amenities in the center, you have kind of private offices on the outside. Here's kind of a zoom and kind of exonometric view. You have a little skylight here. So light and the outdoor connection all seem really important to this group. And that's kind of what, what comfort might look like to some of our some of our students. So now thinking about connection. So kind of keywords that come up with community, communication, collaboration. It seems very socially defined. Um, but also there's kind of this idea of connecting to the inside or the outside, connecting to fellow employees, like the managers. And we're kind of connecting to everything. You can imagine like little tentacles coming out of people. That's what I think about when I saw this data. Um, you want to be connected kind of visually, physically, mentally, and socially. So we're really thinking about kind of different dimensions of how do we connect with different people. And really kind of wanting to just kind of be heard.
confirm and recognize. Again, thinking about that initial model of the positive psychological states, you're seeing how students are articulating this. How do you do that? So again, it's kind of about designing in proximities. Um, you know, I don't know how you can translate this to design, but you know, how do you know that you can approach anyone in the workspace? What does that kind of openness feel like? Connection to the outside, again, is important. We saw that with the last driver. How do you connect ideas, right? How do you collaborate with other people? Um, and then again, shapes are coming up. Again, I'm obsessed with this. I think it's so interesting. But the hexagon came up. I mean, maybe this is the year for the hexagon, right? Like Pantone always has the year of the colors. Maybe this is the year of the hexagon. I'm not sure. Maybe you all can help me, help me understand that. So here's what some of the drawings look like. Um, so kind of these are cubicles, kind of these big square shapes. They're facing the common areas. So there's kind of that visual connection. Even if I'm in a private office, I have that visual connection. Um, you kind of see some sociopedal seating arrangements. So kind of people are able to kind of just visually connect with each other just based on how the furniture is arranged. You can see some trees on the outside. So outside, again, is really important. And it's kind of called collaborative seating. So you see kind of people who are working together in the foreground here and then kind of alone in the background. Um, here's another view of this. Again, look how prominent this outside area is, right? The connection to the outside is really important for this group. Um, we also say that's about kind of connecting to nature and kind of connecting to health. You have different ways to connect with different people, right? You have ping pong tables, you have break rooms, you have a cafeteria. So these elements are really important. Um, and then another another drawing here. Again, we see kind of the hexagonal um, desks kind of coming up here. The whole idea behind that is that it's supposed to kind of facilitate collaboration somehow. We can kind of maybe turn around and if someone's working here, another person's working here, this feels like a collaborative posture, maybe more than sort of just straight straight edges do. And again, you kind of see different facilities that are set up to either connect with other people, conference rooms, break rooms, or kind of share ideas, right? It's an innovation area in an office. Um, kind of having a memo wall, some other way to kind of share ideas. Zooming in here, um, what's interesting is there is this idea that um, walkways are really important. So one way to connect with management is to have a walkway where like, everyone gets to their desk by kind of walking by the managers. It's kind of a cool way to design in behavior, right? Maybe it's deterministic, but it's an interesting way to think about it. How do you make kind of that connection the easiest thing to do? And again, we kind of see a worker activity space in the, in the outdoor area. Thinking about the workplace is kind of outside the box, beyond just the office itself. Moving right along at, at a warp speed, I apologize for going so fast, we have seven drivers to get through. Um, so equity, so what does equity mean? So equity is really about kind of equal opportunity, that can mean kind of fairness or equal allocation of resources. It means kind of having options and choice, there's kind of a kind of freedom there. Um, sharing spaces, feeling of interest, and really it's about kind of having no boundaries or having a sense of transparency. There's a lot of information here, but you know, essentially we're really thinking about um, Having, having the same resources, or at least having the option of, of, of choosing the resources that are available um, to most best meet one person's needs. Um, the, the groups that had equity really struggled with kind of how do you deal with hierarchy, right? And we'll kind of see this play out. Like what happens with manager's offices if you're really designing the kind of most extreme version of equity, how do you deal with kind of the manager versus the non-manager? And we'll see that play out. That was kind of a central tension for a lot of these groups. Um, but really kind of how do you have some of these shared spaces, but also kind of some private spaces. Um, what would transparency look like? Turns out, again, windows and skylights make a huge difference. Um, and also kind of against this idea of kind of equal opportunity. So one way this was operationalized is thinking about, look, there's kind of this equal allocation here, right? Of like the quiet side of the office and the talking side of the office. Um, I'm not sure if like you can't talk on the quiet side, but I just talk in hushed tones. Again, this is kind of a follow up on. That's a pretty obvious way to kind of divide up an equity, right? Another way is to give everyone a chance to contribute to what the surroundings look like. So maybe everyone brings in a piece of art or a poster. So I can say, you know, I am somehow represented in this space. Um, which is kind of a cool idea. But you see the idea of kind of circular desks and somehow feeling more equitable. There's gender neutral bathrooms here. Um, we see this kind of again now kind of the axon view. Um, so you kind of see the art wall up here, again, kind of equal division. Um, one group said, you know, open space can feel really equitable because it's not allocated. Like the minute you kind of allocate space or someone else tells you where you're supposed to sit, that can feel like it's inequitable somehow. So kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting idea. This group I thought was really, really um, 
really kind of struggling with this idea of like, how do we deal with the manager's office, right? So this one says, this is the manager's office that we're pointing to, but half of the people kind of felt it was important for the manager to have the same facilities as everyone else, and half of the group kind of thought it was important for them to have um, something really obviously managerial, so you can kind of have that, you know, that incentive to like work hard and become a manager. So this is a tension. Like, we know this from the literature, right? But we're seeing this play out, and like students are really having having trouble putting that into um, into design form. And I think maybe a lot of us can empathize with that. Um, so then again, so the kind of opportunities for collaboration. If you want it, there's um, there's kind of just pick and choose your own resources. Is kind of the the theme of this slide. Flexibility. What I love about this, being someone who's interested in postural variation, I promise I didn't prompt them to say this, but um, flexibility was defined by our students as kind of cultural flexibility, spatial flexibility, but also bodily. So thinking about postures are really important, right? We kind of design all offices from this posture, maybe now this posture, if you're, you know, um, even standing desks in. Um, but we're going to see that actually these students want more variation in posture. Just the sitting and standing is, is not enough. The choice is really important, and these abstract processes are really important, um, kind of how people think about or how they can express themselves, <coughs> and again, having access to a lot of tools. Um, so again, you can kind of see how these have been uh, kind of further operationalized here. You see some of the same things popping up, right? And we'll kind of talk about this at the end. Um, but I think it's interesting that there's kind of you know, choose your own adventure here, and again, the, the flexible body of this one really stuck out to me, and what we're going to see pictures of that. So it's interesting here, right, in the top, in the corner up here, you can choose to work inside or outside, you can choose to relax outside or work outside. So this is kind of this flexible idea about, you know, where do you want to take a break, where do you want to work, inside, outside, etc. and there's spaces for that. Here it's kind of hard to see, but these are all kind of movable walls, again, that's maybe a more obvious idea of flexibility, but it's kind of this idea that you can kind of create your own space based on your own preference. Um, Next, I love this slide. It might be hard to see um, when, it's, when it's big, but this is just a whole bunch of people in different postures. This one's laying down reading a book. This one's kind of sitting in a way that looks very uncomfortable, but might be very comfortable for this person. I shouldn't judge. Um, you see someone kind of sitting with their legs crossed a little bit, walking around over here. Postural variation is really important. What's really cool about what they said is that this is a carpeted area, and then the team said, you know, if you have a carpeted space, you're more likely to want to sit on it or lay on it, right? Hardwood floors maybe wouldn't be so comfortable. So really thinking about how do you encourage flexibility, thinking about materiality. Again, really cool insight. The other thing I love about this is everything is on wheels, including the tree. So if you wanted to move that tree, you know, or that ficus plant um, from point A to point B, you could do it in this very flexible space. So again, really interesting idea thinking about this, thinking to the extreme. Another way to kind of incentivize this postural variation is to kind of have this little dip down area, right? Maybe symbolically communicating that this space is for something different than just sitting at a desk. Again, very cool ideas if you study um, sort of how the body moves like I do. Predictability, what does that mean? This was one that was a struggle for our groups, to be perfectly honest. Um, so, you know, it would be a place that meets your expectations, that's safe, you know, you can kind of anticipate that the building won't fall down on you, for example. Maybe you have your own autonomy, you can kind of make your own choices, you can kind of have the ability to know that you're going to be able to make those, uh, make your choices if you need to. It has enough resources. You're familiar with the space and the people. Um, and what would this look like? You know, first it's kind of no workplace hazards. You know, nothing kind of throws a kick into your plans in some big, you know, unexpected hazardous event. Um, but again, kind of being able to kind of carve out a sense of privacy of your own personal space would make uh, would make an office feel a bit more predictable. Uh, having sufficient resources, maybe that's a bit more obvious. Um, but it's interesting that really this idea of kind of having almost like a social sense of predictability was really important for both groups that we've, um, we've talked to so far. What would this look like? Wi-Fi is throughout, right? You can you can depend on the Wi-Fi little waves in this in this drawing. So that's kind of one of the resources that they thought was important. Centrally located supplies, right? Consistent personal spaces, um, uh, kind of ample flex space. So essentially, this is kind of saying whatever kind of space you want, like we got it. You you, you can you can you can rely on that when you show up for work in the morning. <coughs> Another idea is to kind of post timetables outside of rooms. You know, when you're familiar with that with conferences, maybe in other circumstances, that might be also helpful. Color coding things can be really helpful. One group said, you know, those little barcodes you can scan if you're if you're more technologically savvy than I am. They're like, why don't you put barcodes in all rooms so you can kind of see what the function of that room or building is? Pretty cool idea. This is the 21st century, after all. 
Other ideas, you know, why don't you put information about staff in the front office or like kind of in the, in the front area so you can at least be visually familiar with people's faces or maybe learn something about them. It's a way to kind of make the, the space feel a bit more predictable by kind of knowing who's working with you. Um, if that doesn't work, maybe a coffee table to help the other people is kind of more, um, more an office's speed. Privacy, um, this one came up a lot kind of throughout all groups, but the group specifically dedicated to looking at privacy. We're just in the very various aspects of privacy, digital, spatial, um, kind of personal, I and mean, then you can kind of see the different issues that came up here. Probably not huge surprises here, um, but again, kind of choice, um, this relationship to comfort was really important. You need to provide spaces for both collaboration and privacy, I thought was interesting because we kind of said design for privacy, but, but, but both, group, both groups were saying, yes, but you still need collaborative space. Like even if you have the most private office, like we assume that you still need to talk to people, which it's an interesting finding in and of itself, I think. Um, how do you kind of carve out personal space? Part of it's kind of controlling access. Part of it's um, personalizing your space, kind of two different dimensions of that. Um, again, comfort kind of comes up. It's kind of a common refrain throughout these different drivers um, and kind of some of these other ideas and we're not sure sort of where to, where to organize them yet. So here's what I mean. Here's kind of an example of this. This is supposed to be kind of a, a very private office, right? But you also see that at the center of it is like this collaborative area, but you have these private offices kind of in this side. So this raises the question of the default. So some of the groups talked about what's the default setting? Is the default that a space should be really private and you can choose to go collaborate if you want to? Or should a space be by default collaborative and then you can kind of find those refuges, those kind of private spaces? That's an open question. It's probably a question that's best offered by individual context. Um, another, this is kind of another idea of kind of on that same theme is that you have some collaborative space, you have some kind of private space, and there's, they kind of merge together somehow. Um, and then another way to kind of carve out some of that private space that we talked about, that personal space, we can use shade and glass, kind of different levels of transparency or opacity. Um, maybe have a doorbell uh, if you really, really want to kind of control who's coming in and out of your space. This is another, um, another group drawing, I know it's hard to see because it's really light, but I'm going to kind of zoom in on a couple of things. What I want to say is this is kind of a, a big office floor plan, and what's cool about it is it actually goes from most public to kind of most private as you go in. So thinking about kind of what's the experience of entry and thinking about maybe you kind of position the most collaborative spaces in the front and they kind of work toward greater privacy as you, as you go in. Um, so kind of there's private offices up there, again kind of this uh, reception area in the front. We actually have a receptionist to kind of help you that gatekeeper. That's one way to reinforce privacy. Um, so kind of in the reception area, you have kind of a gatekeeper, you have a check-in station, you might have a little security monitor, you have key card security. All this is about kind of you know negotiating or managing who's coming in. And, and to our participants, that really felt a lot like what privacy might look like. Individual offices, again, we see this idea of the importance of designing walkways. Except this time, your know, walkways are designed such that you never are kind of walking so that you can see someone's computer monitor, if that makes sense. So like you'd be sitting here, your computer would sensibly be here, and the people would be walking by here. So it's a way to kind of build in some of that visual or maybe digital privacy. Again, maybe it's not groundbreaking stuff, but it's really interesting just to see that this comes up when you give people kind of a blank slate. Tall walls, tall chair backs, or other things that um, people brainstorm, sliding glass doors. What I find really interesting about this kind of zoom in on one of these private offices is how privatized everything is. You even have your own personal fridge and your personal water cooler, right? If you think about the water cooler as being typically like this very social space, this is kind of saying, nope, the extreme of that would be, I want my own water cooler. Like, no discussion around this, like just me, just my private space. So symbolic, I thought that was kind of um, a fun or interesting um, thing that the, the students talked about. And finally, safety. And this was another another uh, driver that I think groups tended to struggle with a little bit more, like what would safety look like? Maybe because it's not super sexy to talk about safety. Um, nevertheless, there's some interesting insights to be gained here. Um, so physical and psychological safety were very important. Um, so again, kind of everything kind of structural safety to think about natural disasters. But also, like, is it safe and inclusive? Like, do I feel a sense of financial security or job security? I mean, what profound things to think about when we think about something like safety? This might look like everything from ensuring that people have privacy or personal space, again, a common refrain, to really thinking about, you know, basically, are we designing safe buildings and are we ready for any emergencies that come up? And if people have the tools they need to respond. Um, and kind of other things, like wayfinding signs and warning signs became really important. 
Um, so a couple of other ideas that came up. This doesn't like read as a particularly safe space, right? Nothing really kind of jumped out, at least at me. It's like, oh, this obviously looks safe. But things that came up were still like natural lighting, right, versus fluorescent lighting. You know, fluorescent lights are bad for us. Have a reception area, right? We have kind of that gatekeeper that provides a sense of safety or security. Gender neutral bathrooms. Maybe that's about psychological safety or even physical safety. So again, there's kind of some profound insights here. Having a strong HR department, someone said. Um, you know, I would feel really, really safe if there was a really strong and responsive HR department. And we see some other ideas here too about even like earth tone and colors would help me feel kind of psychologically safe. Um, kind of emergency buttons, that sort of a thing. And kind of more examples of the same idea. Uh, physical safety, like no bugs. Just get rid of all the bugs and that'll be a safe environment. Uh, having an ID system, uh, having a one-way mirror, which was really interesting. <coughs> so again, this kind of goes everywhere, right? There's really no easy way to, to summarize the things that we learned from this, but I think instead the really the, the, the profound insights that come from is looking at some of these individual responses that people have made. So a couple of things I just wanted to, to highlight really quickly. Um, first, I learned that these drivers are interrelated. Privacy came up a ton, even when we're talking about privacy. Connection came up when we're talking about connection. So that tells me that those are really, really important things, at least for this millennial generation that we are working with. Um, nature was a common thing that came up, right? Connection to the outdoors. It would be not surprising those of us who are steeped in the literature, but you know, it still amazes me that we design classrooms, for example, that we're placing students that don't have windows. Like we know that nature is important, so let's, you know, let's listen to that. Posture. I was so excited to see this come up because ballet's a lot of the work I do. Um, but we also need designing for the body, right? The flexible body is really important to uh, to these teams we talked with. User generated design. Um, so kind of thinking about how do we trust users to kind of either make their own space or give them the tools they need to kind of help design their own environments. Shape, I thought was really interesting, and colors came up. So um, no more white walls, right? No more squares. Let's get creative here. Um, and break rooms came up a lot, actually. It was being kind of a space either for a sense of kind of refuge or a sense of kind of connection. And again, there's kind of that, that dichotomy there, right? They can kind of provide two different functions, right, as I said up here. You know, is it about a sense of connection or a sense of kind of comfort or withdrawal? Kind of other areas of kind of conflict, right? So kind of this messy data tells us also that there's a lot of conflict here, right? So sometimes a group will say something like, I want a very private space, and people say, no, private spaces are terrible for connection, so how do you, how do you remedy that, right? Because ideally, a workspace would speak to all the drivers, not just one. Um, but some, some examples were like walkways. In some cases, walkways would connect people. In other ways, it would kind of help them with a sense of privacy. So what do we do with that? Um, predictability versus unpredictability. One group said, like, unpredictability is actually really good, right? Because that's about creativity. So why do we value predictability so much? Great question. I don't have the answer to that. Um, and also kind of the biggest tension was this um, connection between open and closed spaces. And um, one of the other researchers I work with made this word cloud kind of at the first pass. I know this isn't you know, maybe um, the most like, the most um, informative example of how to look at the data, but look at this, private open spaces. Like what a contradiction in terms, but that was so interesting, right? That is, that is the big dilemma here, right? Like we want privacy, but there's this big drive that we just were talking about for these open spaces, and that's a really difficult thing to, um, to mediate. Okay, so some issues that came up, um, I won't go through all these, but one group said comfort doesn't necessarily equal healthy. Interesting point, right? Um, and are these ideas that we're coming up with, are these about what it would feel like, or is this really people telling us what they would want in the space? I think that's an important distinction to make. So we could design for the most extreme version of privacy, but is that what people want, or is it just what privacy would look like? So we have to suss that out a bit more. So next step. Um, a lot of you might have seen this um, this slide in um, Dr. Banks' presentation earlier, um, but we're thinking about, you know, where does this research fit in and what are next steps? So the, the, what we're doing right now is we're kind of trying to assess these different um, these different drivers, uh, we're kind of identifying some hot spots, so that's what this research is attempting to do, is kind of saying, here are some things that are bubbling to the surface in terms of what might be important in designing for privacy, for example. And then hopefully one day we can kind of inform this, uh, this, this creation of an inventory to kind of say, maybe you know, um, a, a, an office should have these five things to think about. Um, but we also need to test these ideas. So we also need to do a lot more research, right? Like how do we validate what we're finding in this, um, in this study? How can we kind of help that make, um, how can we inform interventions, but also maybe evaluate similar interventions kind of uh, as we use, because it's all kind of hypothetical or theoretical at this point. 
Um, we also need to do a lot more focus groups. So we also want to do focus groups with grad students and people who are working in offices and all of that to kind of start seeing are there common themes that bubble up to the surface? Are there things that are really um, kind of user group specific? So we have a lot of questions left unanswered, but I think we're also answering a couple of things right now, which, which makes me really excited. So kind of one of the big questions I had in starting this research and coming here was, is there anything novel here, right? Like a big fear was doing this research and then we mentioned the wheel, like, hello, we made the wheel, enjoy. I actually think there's something novel coming out of it, both the method in not only evaluating spaces as they are, but also kind of engaging this creative element, um, but also really trying to um, think about <coughs> The other, the other kind of novelty is the actual insights that, that students are generating. You know, hexagonal office, like, I want to see that. Maybe it already exists and I just haven't gotten out of my home space yet, but I think it's pretty interesting. Anyway, that's it. I'm not sure if we're over time or under time, but that's, um, that's where we're at right now, so I'd love any feedback. Great, thanks. <coughs> We don't give them any prompts on like, think about this as a place you want to study versus a place you want to um, maybe do like a, a group innovation project, I'm not sure. So I also think that part of that has to do with the context of the work, the kind of task, personality and task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's kind of, I imagine it's kind of matrix that we can maybe figure out in terms of how you make sense of that. Yeah. Also like workplace culture, that kind of thing too. Yeah. What level of students, these are undergrads? These are undergrad students, yeah. And what sort of yeah, that's a good question. I mean, not, not a ton of overall. Obviously, we're not talking about seasoned professionals. Um, that is a question that we asked about. To be frank, I haven't actually looked at this data and tied it back to um, what each individual participant said from what their work experience was. We did ask that question, so we certainly can't answer that. Um, but I, I would imagine it's, you know, one or two years or less. So we've had an internship or something like that. I think I'm like, you know, if they had done a work by studio or if they had been exposed to other classes and certain precedent. Because I'm sort of curious. I'm sure there is, yeah. And we asked about that. And one of the questions we asked all participants was, um, did anything influence, uh, something like that, did anything influence the idea to come up with today? Granted, that's like the honor code, right? So maybe they're going to share with us or not. But actually, some people are like, yeah, I actually saw an office look exactly like how I designed it. Like, OK, good. That's actually helpful for us to know. Uh, or yeah, I worked for forever in this really terrible place and so I'm designing kind of against that. So we're trying to kind of suss that out. Again, it's not, you know, on exact, but I think it's really interesting. Yeah, I'll just make one more comment. I was in the Facebook offices here in Austin the other day, and there were three floors. I was walking throughout one of the floors, and they had a bunch of open spaces, and maybe uh, I don't know, 20 people in total on that floor. Yeah. And I asked the person who was giving me the tour, is this normal amount of occupancy for this um, particular space? And she was like, yeah, I mean, she didn't have, she was a manager there. So the interesting thing is, they'd spent a lot of money and, and time on art, and these open collaborative spaces, and half the people, more than half the people, weren't even there. Yeah. So presumably, they're either in the field, working from home, working in a coffee shop around the corner. Yeah. So the interesting assumption here is that everyone who's employed will be working <coughs> in the office. Yeah. And that, that what I saw, and I've been to Google offices too, that there was less people actually in the office than what I would have ever expected. Yeah. It's interesting, I'm glad you brought that up, because one thing I forgot to point out in the drawings was, in several of them, there was this idea of kind of a third place, like people drew like a cafe, or yeah. like Mike's Pizzeria down here. And that's actually really important, right? Because that's kind of how people kind of conceiving of this idea of the workplace is actually transcends the box. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I will say is I absolutely think we're in Berkeley, we are right by Silicon Valley. I absolutely think the tech offices have a lot to do with what we're seeing here. Yeah. They're sexy, they're glamorous, and yeah. students are going there for internships and interviews, and they're seeing it. I'm enthralled. The Airbnb offices, when I walk in there, I'm like, if you hire me, I don't have anything to really contribute to you, but I just I want to I work for you. I so I do think there is that aura, and I think part of it is how do we suss that out? Because we don't want to, again, recreate the tech offices if we don't know how they're working um, and also the network for every context. So I would 